Check one, two, mic check, one, two, check, check. You hearing that?
The uh, Judiciary Committee's Committee on Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberty will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to prepare recesses of subcommittee at any time. I welcome everyone to today's hearing on the need to reauthorize the September 11th Victim Compensation Fund. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. September 11, 2001 was among the deadliest days in American history, with almost 3,000 lives lost in New York, at the Pentagon, and in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, because of the terrorist attacks in the United States on that horrible day. But the casualty number is much higher than what is often cited as statistics tell us. And in fact, we really do not know the full casualty count from the events of that day, even now, almost 18 years later. That's because years after 9-11, tens of thousands of the first responders who ran towards the raging infernos toxic clouds unleashed on that day, as well as members of the community surrounding the 9-11 crash site in New York, continue to develop and suffer from cancers and other severe diseases that have prematurely ended their lives or undermined their employment and life prospects. Indeed, by one estimate, up to 400,000 people may be at risk of developing 9-11 related illnesses, and many of these people may not even be aware of that fact. In recognition of this continued suffering, Congress among other things, reopened the September 11th Victim Compensation Fund in legislation passed in 2010, signed into law in 2011, and authorized the Victims Compensation Fund for five years. Congress established the original fund just 11 days after 9-11 to provide compensation for those who were physically injured by the attacks and for relatives of those who were killed. That original fund operated from 01 to 04 and awarded over $7 billion. When it reopened, uh, the fund in 2011, Congress expanded the eligibility criteria to include workers who assisted with debris removal in the months after the attacks. Congress then reauthorized the fund in 2015 for an additional five years and is currently set to expire in December of 2020. In reopening the Victims Compensation Fund, Congress was addressing the fact that responders and recovery workers reportedly significant higher risks of lower and upper respiratory diseases in the general population within five years of the 9-11 attacks, and 70 percent of the 9-11 first responders suffer from new or worsened respiratory symptoms in that time period. These diseases only worsened in severity over time as they developed into interstitial lung disease and sarcoidosis, conditions in which lung function substantially deteriorates, preventing adequate oxygen from entering the bloodstream and vital organs and leading to additional life-threatening conditions like pulmonary disease. Now, we are seeing that one of our witnesses, Dr. Jacqueline Moline, characterizes as a third wave of 9-11 related illnesses, including the increased cancer rate among first responders and community members since 2015. Part of that reason is that cancer can have a very long latency period, meaning the symptoms of the disease may not manifest in a person for decades after the initial exposure to carcinogens. In the face of these trends, the fund, which is overseen by the Department of Justice, has done an admirable job. As of April 30, 2019, the Victims' Compensation Fund received nearly 50,000 claims, found about 24,000 claimants to be eligible for compensation, it's about half, and made initial or revised awards for 28,000 claims, awarded a total of more than $5 billion as of April 30. Unfortunately, the fund is now facing a funding crisis, one that is not of its own making. When Congress reauthorized the Victims' Compensation Fund in 2015, it prohibited the fund from spending more than the appropriated $7.5 $4 billion to pay awards and administrative expenses. By law, the fund must annually reassess its policies and procedures to assure, among other things, that it does not exceed this spending cap. Yet since 2015, the, the Victims' Compensation Fund has seen an increase in claims driven by various factors, including a marked increase in cancer claims and claims from the survivor population. The result is that effective February 25, 2019, the fund was forced to institute substantial cuts to pending and future awards, 50 percent cuts for claims on or before February 1, 2019, and 70% cuts for claims filed thereafter. Congress has proposed a solution, H.R. 1327, the Never Forget the Heroes, the Permanent Authorization of the September 11th Victim Compensation <coughs> Fund Act, would authorize the VCF until 2090, ensure that sufficient funds are available to pay future claims, require payment of any award amounts that were cut, and make a number of other useful changes. By enacting this legislation, we will not have to force 9-11 responders and survivors to come begging to Congress every five years to step up and do the right thing. I am proud to be a co-sponsor of this bill. I'm proud because this is not simply a, a New York event, and I see Mr. Zeldin's here, who represents part of New York and showing his interest, as well as Ms. Maloney and Mr. King. And Mr. Nadler has been a champion of this issue and is chairman of this committee. And primarily responsible for this uh, hearing. But this was an American tragedy, an American event, and I re 
recall it uh, so vividly. And I was in New York within a month and uh, going to a baseball championship game and ran into Giuliani, who at the time was a friendly guy, and uh, got me somehow down to 9-11. And I went down there and had my mask and you name it, and walked around in the debris. <coughs> I, I commend all of you for what you did. You put your health and your life at risk. We know that, and you need to be compensated. You're American heroes. Uh, Representative Maloney and King have introduced the bill that will affect the, the, the work on behalf of 9-11 responders and survivors. I thank them, and uh, I, I thank uh, Representative Collins for his co-sponsorship of the bill. I'm thankful for the responders for the service and sacrifice for our country. Grateful to them, to the survivors, and all the witnesses, uh, and to testify before us today. Uh, this is a bit unusual because this is my subcommittee, which I, I chair, and I'm chairing it now. But it's a, a special moment for Mr. Nadler. This is an issue that's very close to him and his constituents, and for that reason, I will uh, surrender the chair to him to uh, oversee this meeting, which is appropriate, and I guess this is the time that I'll do it. I don't know if it's the right time, but this is the time I'm doing it. <laughs> well, I'll recognize Mr. Johnson then, and then I'm surrendering the chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the tragic events of September 11, 2001 in New York and Pennsylvania and Virginia took innocent lives on American soil on a scale not seen since the attack on Pearl Harbor. It also unified the country as brave first responders searched for bodies and headed a massive recovery effort. In New York, the first responders did this amidst a smoldering pile of over 220 stories of building crushed into a dense accumulated mountain of steaming hot, toxic chemicals that burned for months. My wife and I visited that site just a month after, and it was still seemingly on fire. Many sacrificed their own health and their efforts to help their fellow Americans in and around debris that included two steel beams in the shape of a cross, which now rest in the National September 11th Memorial and Museum. Just as that cross stood as a sign of hope for so many, so too do our programs to help take care of those to whom we owe our deepest gratitude. After 9-11, a federally funded program was created to compensate and pay medical expenses for those who developed respiratory and other illnesses related primarily to the rehabilitation of the site of the former World Trade Center. Payments made from the fund are administered by a special master who has announced that the fund is running out of money and with some current and future claims that are yet unpaid. That fund was authorized in the manner in which all federal programs should be authorized, namely for a limited duration, within which time Congress is able to periodically revisit the program's operation and fiscal solvency before potentially reauthorizing and funding it further as it goes forward into the future. The special master who runs this program and who is with us here today is a very well-regarded public servant, and I'm aware of no problems with the program's administration. We have a lot of confidence in this program. And so I support reauthorizing the program in a manner that's fair to everyone. This is unquestionably the right thing to do and I expect that this bill will pass with, with broad bipartisan support. I am personally, myself, the son of a firefighter who was critically burned and permanently disabled in the line of duty back in 1984, and I know the, the sacrifices and the needs of these heroes and their families personally. Um, in addition to my dad being burned over 80% of his body, third degree burns, uh, he inhaled toxic chemicals in a, in a, in a fire, and uh, he suffered the remaining 32 years of his life uh, as a result of that tragedy. The, the only concern we have here, and you'll hear people talk about it, is, is just the latest proposal to reauthorize the programs, H.R. 1327, creates an unlimited authorization for appropriations for the fund and extends it until the year 2090. The Congressional Budget Office uh, isn't able to determine the cost of such an extended program, uh, and of course its rules limit it to predicting costs just 10 years out. So right now we have a $22 trillion federal debt, and that's just the thing that keeps us up at night. It, it makes us have to address these issues as responsibly as possible, and I know everyone here uh, understands and feels that burden. Our objective, of course, is fairness to all. And by all, we mean all Americans, including first responders nationwide who have heeded the call to service through the smoldering remains of terrorist attacks, but also through the dense wildfire smoke of California and the wreckage following a, a Kansas tornado and the floods in Louisiana and all other disasters and tragedies everywhere. We have to approach the reauthorization of this fund today in the same way we would approach any fund designed to compensate first responders nationwide in other similar circumstances and in a way capable of making future funds available for future heroes as well. With that, we look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses here today, including those who work so selflessly under very dangerous conditions 
to help our nation heal. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. 18 years ago, on September 11, 2001, Osama bin Laden orchestrated the deadliest terrorist attack in American history, killing almost 3,000 people in a single day and wounding thousands of more. In New York City, the attack happened in my district. The attacks created an environmental nightmare when the Twin Towers collapsed in Lower Manhattan. Hundreds of tons of contaminants poured onto the streets and covered first responders, residents, office workers, and students in a cloud of dust. When many of us think of 9-11, we think of planes flying into the Twin Towers, or we see the towers collapsing. But there were other pictures that day that captured the gra gravity of the loss, the scale of the destruction, and the massive amounts of toxins that were released into the air on that Tuesday morning. I want to share those images with you today. As you can see, if you look at the uh, jumbotrons, I suppose, as you can see, New York City was covered in toxic ash. The air was full of debris, dust, and other deadly toxins. Many of my constituents were forced to flee their homes. Firefighters, police, and rescue and recovery workers from around the country came to our aid, working in horrible, dangerous conditions to help one another and help the United States get back on its feet. I was in Washington with my wife when the attacks began, and we immediately rushed to return to New York City by train that day since all flights had been grounded. What sticks with me from that day was the eerie silence that greeted us when we stepped out of Penn Station. The city seemed empty, nothing moving, no people, no cars, no buses, no subway trains, nothing. The only thing that was there was a strange odor that hung in the air. The next day on September 12th, I walked the streets of Lower Manhattan through the rivers of ash and debris, and I saw the unthinkable damage. I was there with then Mayor Giuliani, and we were soon joined by then President George Bush, then Senator Hillary Clinton, and Senator Chuck Schumer. There was no question in our minds that we must work together in a bipartisan manner to do what it took to get New York back on its feet, to get the country moving again, and to get help for everyone affected by the attacks. But in the days following the attack, a problem arose. The EPA insisted, contrary to ample evidence, that the air in Lower Manhattan and Brooklyn was safe to breathe. That was not true. It was an untruth that caused many thousands of people to become sick, and tragically for many of those same people to die. And it was an untruth I worked for many years to expose, because as we knew even then, the air was not safe to breathe. In fact, it was deadly. Thousands of responders from all over the country worked on the site. Thousands and thousands of responders and workers and residents were exposed to horrible toxins and were not provided with protective equipment. The federal government did not step in to conduct a proper comprehensive cleanup of the schools, offices, and residences in Lower Manhattan. They told my constituents to clean up asbestos and other toxins from their apartments with a damp cloth and no protective equipment. Today, as a result of the attacks and as a result of those lies, more than 95,000 responders and survivors are sick. It was for those tens of thousands of brave, selfless, and innocent responders and survivors that Congress came together in 2010 after years of struggles and negotiations to pass the James Adroga 9-11 Health and Compensation Act and to fulfill our moral obligation, as Lincoln said, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan. The Zadroga Act established a national health program to care for those made sick by exposure to toxins in the days, weeks, and months after the 9-11 attack. It also reopened the Victim Compensation Fund, the VCF, to provide, to provide support for sick responders or survivors. As the programs were set to expire in 2015, Congress once again came together in a bipartisan manner and reauthorized them. We made the health program essentially permanent and set the expiration date far into the future, the year 2090, ensuring that all those affected by the attacks on September 11, 2001 would have the health care they need for as long as they need it. But the 2015 reauthorization only extended the VCF for five years. Today, the programs are mostly working. Residents of 433 out of 435 congressional districts receive care through the 9-11 health program. More than 28,000 individuals representing all 50 states have been found eligible for compensation from the VCF. More than $5.1 billion has been awarded. Our actions as a Congress have touched many lives, provided comfort to the sick, and helped families struggling with the loss of a loved one 
to pay the bills and send children to college. We know all too well that people who are sick now will only get sicker, and unfortunately many will die. Those who are not sick now may become sick years in the future as diseases surface after long latency periods. We are already seeing the impact that long delayed cancers have had. Nearly 11,000 responders and survivors have been diagnosed with cancer to date, a number which will only go up. It is clear the five-year reauthorization was not nearly long enough. <clears throat> Further, as the number of sick responders and survivors continues to rise, the limited resources Congress provided to the VCF have been strained. And now, because of the greater number of, of sick people than anticipated, the thousands of sick responders and survivors are facing up to 70% cuts in compensation because the money is running out. These cuts were certainly not intended by Congress, and we know that the administration and the special master are not making these cuts maliciously. Rather, the VCF is working to keep the funded, I'm sorry, is working to keep the program funded as long as possible to give every sick responder and survivor at least some compensation. But that does not mean we can simply accept these cuts and allow the program to expire when so many more men, women, and young adults will need compensation and care. That is what brings us here today. A 70% cut in compensation to victims of 9-11 is simply intolerable, and Congress must not allow it. Congress also must not allow the VCF to expire while people are still sick, and the World Trade Center Health Program is still operational. The time has come for us to act. In the past, I would have had to call upon a committee chairman to call a hearing or to schedule a markup on legislation to address these problems. But today, as chairman of the Judiciary Committee, I am able to convene this hearing and to announce that we will not wait to mark up this legislation. We will hold a markup of this legislation tomorrow. There are two moral imperatives that dictate why we must act. Number one, it was America that was attacked on 9-11, not just New York or Washington, D.C. Number two, it was the federal government that bears some responsibility because it told everyone it was safe to return to Lower Manhattan when it knew that it was not. Now the federal government must bear the burden to care for and support the people affected by the September 11th attacks and their aftermath. Again, I am proud to work in a bipartisan manner with my longtime colleagues, Representatives Carol Maloney and Peter King, and Senators Kirsten Gillibrand and Chuck Schumer to reauthorize these critical programs. I am pleased that we also have the support of Senator Cory Gardner and our very own ranking member of the full Judiciary Committee, Representative Doug Collins. In fact, we have more than 300 bipartisan co-sponsors of this bill in the House. And I want to thank the people in this room for everything they have done to get so many congressional co-sponsors so quickly. I urge all of my colleagues to work with us in support of reauthorization and to move this bill through Congress to the President's desk as quickly as possible. Just as we stood together as a nation in the days following September 11, 2001, and just as we stood together in 2010 and 2015 to authorize and fund these vital programs, we must now join forces one more time to ensure that the heroes of 9-11 are not abandoned when they need us most. We must sustain the VCF. We must protect the heroes and survivors of 9-11 we must pass the Never Forget the Heroes Act of 2019, and we will. Before I yield back, I want to add one more thing. For many people in this country, and perhaps even people on this committee, 9-11 ended that day. Perhaps they light a candle in church every year on the anniversary. Perhaps they pray for the victims. But for our panel of witnesses today, for many people in the audience, for Congresswoman Maloney, for Congressman King, and for me and my staff, 9-11 never ended. We live every day with the events of that morning and the impact of the decisions made by the federal government in the aftermath. While I know it can be frustrating watching a body as large as the U.S. Congress work its will, when we do act, we can bring tremendous resources and the strength of the entire federal government to bear on a problem, and we can improve the lives of so many. It is my hope and my sincere wish that Congress will act swiftly to stop these devastating cuts, to extend this program, and to provide as much peace of mind as we possibly can to those who continue to suffer from the 9-11 attacks. We will never forget. I yield back. It is now my pleasure to recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, this is a day in which we do come together uh, in this committee, I think, with a common purpose, and I want to thank uh, Congresswoman Maloney and 
Congressman King, but also my friend Lee Zeldin, who has a number of these uh, folks in his district, and along with you, Mr. Chairman, who have been carrying this fight. Because as we look across uh, what we're talking about here, we have to remember that on that day, depraved Islamic terrorists designed September 11th attacks to murder as many innocent Americans as possible, either on that day or in the future, is what happened. Those attacks killed almost 3,000 people and left a smoldering pile of toxic debris in New York. In the wake of such depravity, thousands of rescuers responded with nobility and courage. First responders scaled smoldering piles of debris, exhumed victims with dignity, and restored Ground Zero to its current place in the center of a loving, resilient community, a place that includes the National September 11th Memorial. Even yesterday, this lives on, as I heard a story just yesterday that they identified another victim. 18 years later, no one is forgotten. No one is left behind. That's what our country symbolizes. But it's also fitting Congress do more than memorialize. We must help take care of those heroes. The 9-11 first responders, like all first responders, deserve to have their sacrifices recognized. This program will mitigate the damage these public servants and their families experience as a direct result of their sacrifice on behalf of others. Legislation has been introduced to reauthorize the current September 11th Victims' Compensation Fund. And while the fiscal impact of this legislation isn't clear at the moment, what is clear is our collective duty to see that our first responders are treated fairly in accordance with what they have already given to a grateful nation. I must also say on a personal note, you never forget, and I carried the images that I'm proud the chairman actually showed this morning with me when I was in Iraq. For the time I served there was a reminder of the service that had already been given, not knowing on that morning what would happen, but knowing on that morning it would not be forgotten. And what we are seeing today, as I can remember back as a chaplain, what I serve as as an Air Force and still do 19 years later, is I remember Chaplain Judge being carried out. The first, the honest sacrifice of one serving others and the many that were to follow. Those are the images that bring us to this hearing today. And we can have differences, but they became heroes, angels in heaven, if you would, without asking. They began that day with hope, with love, on a morning very similar as today. And out of the fires of terror revealed the still of our country that is still revealed in our people today. With that, it is our time to act. It is our time to finish this. It is our time to remember the work, the life, the pictures, and the families that we will never forget in fact, we will look back on and find our strength in those who went before and who are suffering now. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Collins. And before I introduce the witnesses, I want to note the presence here of our colleague, uh, Lee Zeldin. And I want to take this opportunity to thank him for his uh, great work in supporting the bill and in gathering a lot of the co-sponsors. I will now introduce the witnesses on the first panel. The Honorable Carolyn Maloney represents the 12th Congressional District of New York. She has been a member of Congress since 1993. Among her many accomplishments, she is one of the lead sponsors of H.R. 1327, the Never Forget the Heroes Permanent Authorization of the September 11th Victim Compensation Fund Act. She has long been a leader in fighting to help victims of the 9-11 attacks and, and has been a staunch advocate for the Victim Compensation Fund. The Honorable Peter King represents the 2nd Congressional District of New York. He has also been a member of Congress since 1993, and among other things, has been a tireless champion of 9-11 responders and survivors. He has long worked with Representative Maloney and with me to create the World Trade Center Health Program and to reopen and sustain the Victim Compensation Fund. Please note that your written statements will be entered into the record in their entirety. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. I'm supposed to read this, which you know. To help you stay within that time, there's a timing light under the table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals your five minutes have expired. And I hope the members of the second panel have heard that so I don't have to repeat that later. <laughs> Representative Maloney, you may begin. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Nadler and Cohen, Ranking Members Collins and Johnson. I want to thank you for inviting me to testify today on the Never Forget the Heroes Permanent Authorization of the September 11 Victim Compensation Fund, which I introduced with Chairman Nadler, King, and 90 of our colleagues. 
Today, we are proud to have a strongly bipartisan bill with 306 co-sponsors, 80 of them are Republican, and I am grateful that the committee recognizes the importance of supporting 9-11 responders, survivors, and their families, and the urgency of passing this bill as soon as possible. We recently remembered D-Day, a day when all Americans came together to defend democracy, liberty, and freedom. And though we are not members of the greatest uh, greatest generation. Our first responders defended, and many gave their lives for just those same values. On September 11, this country was uh, horrifically attacked, killing exactly 2,997 innocent people. They were murdered, and 1,000 more were injured in New York, Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and at the Pentagon simply for being American or being on American soil. And yet, it still gets worse. The death toll from that terrible day continues to grow. In the years since 9-11, tens of thousands more men and women, including first responders, relief workers, local residents, have lost their lives or gotten sick as a result of their exposure to toxic chemicals, pulverized glass, powdered cement, at the crash sites, even though the U.S. government told them repeatedly, over and over again, that it was safe to work at the site. Soon deaths from 9-11 diseases may outnumber those lost on that fateful day. 9-11 was an attack on America, and in response, our nation committed to finding those responsible and holding them accountable. The first veterans of the war on terror were the first responders the volunteers, and the survivors of 9-11. Today, they live all over the country in 433 out of the 435 congressional districts. They are firefighters, police officers, construction workers, electrical engineers, volunteers, and from every single state who answered the call and traveled to New York or D.C. or Pennsylvania to help with the recovery. We have a moral obligation to provide support and compensation to these heroes and their families. Not only did they come to our aid when we needed them, but many are sick because they trusted the federal government when it said that the air around Ground Zero was safe to breathe. In October 2011, a nine-year fight, the James Zadroga 9-11 Health and Compensation Act of 2010 was signed into law, establishing the World Trade Center Health Program and reopening and revising the September 11th Victims' Compensation Fund. These programs provide health monitoring and financial compensation to first responders, survivors, and their families. In 2015, I'm proud to say that Congress permanently reauthorized the health program, but the Victims' Compensation Fund will expire next year if we don't act because it was only given a five-year extension. Making matters worse, the special master of the fund announced in February that the fund would not make it to 2020 because of a funding shortfall, partly due to the increase in cancer claims. In order to extend its life, the VCF was forced to cut all, all pending awards by 50 to 70 percent, and this was devastating to the survivors and their families. For the last three and a half months, they have not been getting the help they deserve the help that our nation owes them. Since February 2019, more than 830 compensation recipients have, rec have received reduced awards from the VCF because of this shortfall. This is unacceptable, and we need to correct it. They shouldn't have to worry about the program running out of funding, and they should not have to come back to Congress every five years to beg for program reauthorization that kind of uncertainty is unfair and unsustainable. Our legislation would make these families whole by re requiring the special master to revisit these reduced claims and pay out the differences. I must tell you that, as evidenced by the more than 300 co-sponsors of the Never Forget the Heroes Act, this is not a Democrat or Republican issue or a New York issue. These are Americans of all political persuasions in every corner of our country 
who are counting on us. Our whole country owes them a debt, a debt that we can never fully repay. Uh, and, and look at the people who are sitting here with us today. These are the heroes and the heroines, the reasons that we are fighting so hard for this uh, program. I want to conclude by recognizing them and thanking them and their families for the hours that they have spent lobbying, working to get this program reauthorized. You will hear from a few of them today, and they continue to be our inspiration every single day that we fight for their health care and their financial security. And as much as I love being with them and talking to them, they should not have to come back to Congress for another reauthorization. We are counting on you to make this program permanent, to reauthorize it. Uh, that's the least that we can do as a grateful nation. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, let me also note the presence here of another longtime and key supporter of the 9-11 uh, uh, of the Zadrog Act and the subsequent bills, uh, Congressman Elliot Engel. New York. Uh, Representative King, uh, you may begin now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll submit my statement for the record. I'd just like to make a few remarks here on this vital, vital bill. I want to thank you. I want to thank the uh, ranking member, uh, Congressman Collins, ranking member, Ms. Johnson, and also Steve Cohen. Uh, this is a, uh, such a vital bill, uh, and it has a human aspect to it. And I want to also just mention all of the FDNY, NYPD, uh, Port Authority cops, EMS workers, court officers, construction workers, residents, your residents, Jerry, students, all of whom have suffered over the years. We went through uh, <clears throat> six months of wakes and funerals after 9-11, and we thought that was it. And now, the last few years, mm -hmm. those wakes and funerals have started again. Just, uh, just last week in uh, uh, East Meadow, about 10 minutes from my home, a, a, a Port Authority lieutenant died from 9-11 illness. So this is something that goes on and on and on, and it's soon we'll have more people dying after 9-11 than actually died on 9-11. And that shows how vital this is. This is not a New York issue, it's not a New Jersey issue, it's definitely a national issue. And uh, I want to also take the time to uh, thank the Special Master. I think I want to re-emphasize what you had said. This program has been run exceptionally well. Uh, the fact that it's running out of funds is no reflection at all on the administration of the program. It, rather, it's a reflection of how deadly these illnesses are and how uh, long they were dormant and latent, and how deadly they are, and how vicious they are. And all of us knows a uh, friend, a neighbor, a constituent, uh, friends of neighbors and constituents who are suffering and have died, people who are going back every three or four months for medical tests, taking 20, 30 uh, medications a day, constantly going back in for biopsies. This is a real national tragedy, which did not end at all on, November, on uh, September 11th or September 12th. Just the other day, I got a call from a uh, local radio reporter who was just diagnosed several months ago and just finished his chemotherapy. He was down there for weeks and months afterwards reporting, uh, again, as to what had happened there, what was going on. And as brave as those men and women were who rushed in on uh, September 11th, and nobody can ever, ever question or even think of excelling the bravery those, they showed. But as you said, Jerry, I think too often we forget what went on in those weeks and months afterwards when people were down there inhaling those toxic fumes involved in the uh, recovery, involving, uh, in, involved in doing what they could to find the remains of their loved ones. So again, we owe it to all of them. And let me give a special thanks to John Stewart. There's probably not that many issues that John Stewart and I would be agreeing on, but I've never seen anyone put himself into a cause more than this. And not just doing, you know, going on television, that's easy for him. What's tough is going the grunt work of going door to door, talking to members of Congress. He has more patience than I would have in talking to some members of Congress. He just goes in there and he, he, he just uh, really just will talk and mm -hmm. explain, uh, tell you why this is a human issue, why it's not a Republican or Democratic issue. And uh, again, he just does an excellent job and I really want to thank him. I don't think we, we would have been where we were back in 2015 or we would have been uh, where we are now if we're not for John's efforts. So John, I want to thank you for that. And uh, also, uh, I want to thank uh, Lee Zeldin, Elliot Engel. Uh, Elliot's been there from the start. Lee has been there since, ever since he came to Congress, and he realizes the true impact of this. And again, uh, Ranking Member Johnson, I know you mentioned the issue of cost, and that has to be addressed. I'm not 
But on the other hand, we have to find a way to get it done. I mean, it's really, it's, I, I'm not saying it's simple, but in many ways it is. We have an obligation to get this done. These are real people who are dying, and we have an obligation to them and to their families because they are there, uh, not through any fault of theirs, but because of their courage, because of their bravery, because they, some, because, uh, like, Congressman Nadal, some of his residences lived in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they were told it was safe to continue living there. Students at Stuyvesant High School. I mean, this is a, these are innocent victims. They're the first innocent victims of the first great war of, of the 21st century. And we owe it to them, but also we owe it to future generations. If something like this should, God forbid, happen in the future, we want those people who are rushing into the buildings, those people who are taking care of the recovery, uh, that they know, that they are assured that they will receive the compensation from the government that they deserve. So again, I am proud to be here today. I can't emphasize enough how vital this legislation is, and also to thank the men and women behind us who, you know, they're the ones who are suffering. Carol and you and I, we can talk about it. We can mm -hmm. sort of argue on the floor of Congress about it. But that's nothing compared to what they're going through every day of their lives. So with that, I uh, thank you for holding this hearing. I thank the members for their attention. I thank the uh, witnesses that are coming after us. And I just say that uh, September 11th showed the true bravery of the American people. The weeks and months after that showed the resilience and bravery of the American people. And also, I think if we can get this job done, it will show that Congress understands and respects and will always honor those who put their lives on the line for their country. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative King. Um, I obviously share those sentiments. I want to also note uh, the presence of a number of the uh, advocates who have fought so long for this legislation. John Field has been one of the leaders of them. Uh, we'll now hear from our second panel of witnesses. Um, and uh, while they're uh, getting seated, I'll, I'll do the introductions. Uh, Rupa Bhattacharya is the special master for the September 11th Victim Compensation Fund. She was appointed to that position by the Attorney General in July 2016. During her tenure as special master, she has overseen the award of over $3.3 billion to more than 13,000 eligible claimants. She first joined the Department of Justice in 1996 through the Attorney General Honors Program as a trial attorney in the Civil Division, and has spent most of her career there, eventually rising to Director of the Torts Branch prior to her appointment as Special Master. She received her JD from Harvard Law School, a Master's Degree in International Relations from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, and her Bachelor's Degree from Tulane University. Dr. Jacqueline Moline is Professor of Occupational Medicine, Epidemiology, and Prevention and internal medicine at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. She's also an adjunct clinical associate professor of preventive medicine at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. In addition, she serves as a member of the World Trade Center Health Program Steering Committee. She received her MD from the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine, her Master of Science degree in Community Medicine from Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and a BA from the University of Chicago. Lila Nordstrom, is a 9-11 survivor and was a Stuyvesant High School student on September 11, 2001. She currently serves as Executive Director of Stuy Health, a position she has held since May 2006. In that role, she creates and coordinates efforts to educate young adults about health services available to 9-11 survivors. Today, however, she is testifying in her personal capacity. She has also worked as a freelance writer and columnist. She received her BA with honors from Vassar College. Anesta St. Rose Henry is the widow of a construction worker and 9-11 World Trade Center responder Candidus Henry, who was a member of the Laborers International Union of North America, Local 79. Mr. Henry was working for a contractor at Ground Zero from February 2002 to June 2002. He died last month from a 9-11 related cancer. Thomas Monell retired as a supervisory special agent after a 30-year career with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. On September 11, 2001, Mr. Monell witnessed American Airlines Flight 77 crash and explode into the Pentagon. He immediately responded to the crash site and continued working at the Pentagon for the next two months. As a result of this work, he incurred a serious illness. He received his bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Lycoming College. Michael O'Connell retired as lieutenant with the Fire Department of the City of New York in 2009. From September 11th through, two, through September 8th, 2001,
Trade Center site. He was a FDNY. He joined the FDNY in 1998 and later joined the FDNY, I'm sorry, he joined the NYPD, the police department in 1998, and later joined the fire department in 2001. As with several of our other witnesses, Mr. O'Connell incurred a serious illness as a result of his re re rescue and recovery work. He studied nursing at Malloy College and Nassau Community College. Luis Alvarez is a retired bomb squad detective with the New York Police Department. He was a responder at the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. Today, he suffers from 9-11 related liver cancer that has metastasized throughout most of his body and is about to have a 69th round of chemotherapy. Prior to joining the NYPD, he served in the United States Marine Corps. After retiring from the NYPD, Luis became an explosive ordnance disposal technician with the Transportation Security Administration at John F. Kennedy International Airport. John Stewart is the former host of The Daily Show and Comedy Central. Of most relevance to today's hearing, he has been an outspoken advocate for 9-11 responders and survivors, and for both the September 11th Victim Compensation Fund and the World Trade Center Health Program. He has been a tireless advocate in raising awareness about the treatment of 9-11 responders and survivors. To this end, he invited several of them onto The Daily Show, made numerous trips to Capitol Hill to, to, Hill to advocate on their behalf. He is a graduate of the College of William and Mary. We welcome our distinguished witnesses, and we thank you all for participating in today's hearing. Now, if you would please rise and raise your right hand, I will begin by swearing you in. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? So help you God. The witnesses may be seated. Let the, witness, let the record show the witnesses, affirmative, the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please note that your written statements will be entered into the record in their entirety. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. To help you stay within that time, there is a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals your five minutes have expired. Ms. Bhattacharya, you may begin. Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Collins, Chairman Cohen, Ranking Member Johnson, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify about the September 11th Victim Compensation Fund, or the VCF. Hearings like this remind us that September 11th, 2001, marked only the beginning of an ongoing and evolving tragedy. To those of you who share the table with me, who were there, who responded to the attacks, or would not allow terrorism to prevent you from returning to your schools, homes, or workplaces, thank you for your heroism and your sacrifice. I have spent my career in public service, including more than 20 years at the Justice Department, but since the Attorney General appointed me as Special Master in 2016, I have been humbled by the responsibility of serving the strong and resilient 9-11 community. I was privileged recently to attend the dedication of the Memorial Glade at the 9-11 Museum in New York, and I was reminded of the startling fact that the nearly 3,000 lives lost on September 11th may soon be overtaken by the number of lives lost in the years afterwards to illnesses that stemmed from exposure to toxins at all three attack sites. While no amount of money can fully compensate for such losses, I am proud that the VCF has been able to provide some needed relief to those who have suffered for so long. The VCF is an extraordinarily successful program. As of May 31st, we have awarded almost $5.2 billion to nearly 22,500 individuals who suffer physical health conditions including to the families of more than 850 who have died as a result of their exposure in New York City, at the Pentagon, and in Shanksville. Those compensated include first responders, workers or volunteers in construction, cleanup and debris removal, and people who lived, worked, or went to school in the affected areas. The VCF has received claims from individuals in every state of the nation, including those who came in from around the country as part of the response efforts, and those who have relocated in the years since the attacks. 
In my three years at the VCF, we have significantly improved efficiency and claim determination rates. The VCF now issues at nearly as many awards each year as it did in total in its first five years. And the VCF under my leadership has not documented a single instance of fraud in a paid claim. We work diligently with the Department's Office of the Inspector General to ensure that any indicia of fraud is investigated and reconciled. Despite its successes, however, the VCF faces a difficult situation. We received a record number of new claims in 2018, and we are on pace to exceed that number in 2019. The issue is basic math. Almost $5.2 billion awarded to nearly 22,500 individuals, just over $2 billion left, with over 21,000 claims and amendments still needing a decision, and thousands more expected to be filed before the VCF's December 18th, 2020 deadline. Several trends help us understand how we got here. Since reauthorization of the Zadroga Act in December of 2015, we have seen a dramatic increase in claims filed on behalf of those who have died as a result of their 9-11 related exposure, a significant increase in cancer claims, and a marked increase in claims from survivors, meaning those who lived, worked, or went to school in the affected areas. Taking account of these trends and the increasing rates of both claim submissions and award determinations, in February, I determined that the VCF had insufficient funding to compensate all pending claims and those projected to be filed under then existing policies. With that determination, I was required by law to modify VCF policies and procedures so that the VCF does not exceed its appropriated limit. This meant making significant reductions in awards. In deciding how to do this, I felt strongly that I could not leave some claimants uncompensated or fail to make allowance for those who suffered most. I concluded that the fairest solution was to apply a percentage reduction to all claims. Thus, depending on when the claim was submitted, calculated loss values are being reduced by either 50 or 70 percent with required offsets taken in full. I wish to thank the Judiciary Committee and the members of this subcommittee for giving me the opportunity to speak to you about this successful and important program. Along with my dedicated staff and with the full support of the Justice Department, I remain strongly committed to serving the 9-11 community. We remain hopeful that our work continues to provide needed relief. And we stand ready, along with the Justice Department, to work with you to ensure that Congress has the information it needs to address appropriate legislative options. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moline. Good morning, Chairman Nadler, Chairman Cohen, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the committee. I'm honored to be here this morning. My name is Dr. Jacqueline Moline. I'm the chairperson of the Department of Occupational Medicine, Epidemiology, and Prevention at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra University, Northwell. And I'm the, the director of the Northwell Queens World Trade Center Health Program. My specialty, occupational and environmental medicine, deals with the impact of hazardous substances on the health of individuals. On September 11th, I, like every person in New York, watched in shock and horror as our nation was attacked. My colleagues at Mount Sinai, where I was then working, knew of the potential for health effects related to asbestos and other toxicants. We knew there would be disease in the short term and the long term. Our immediate concern was for those acute health effects, the first wave. My colleagues and I have written extensive about this, extensively about this, and copies of some publications are attached to my testimony. At Mount Sinai, we began seeing patients that month through the tremendous efforts of the New York Congressional Delegation on Organized Labor, in April 2002, we were given one year of funding to begin medical surveillance programs for rescue and recovery workers, construction workers, and volunteers exposed at the pile. At the beginning, we could only evaluate patients and tell them their health conditions. We were not allowed to provide treatment. This program was extended one year, and we continued a partnership with SUNY Stony Brook, Queens College, New York University, and Rutgers, to see patients in, con in locations convenient for them. These surveillance programs continued, eventually including treatment, and evolved into the World Trade Center Health Program authorized 
eventually by the James Adroga Act of 2010. After reauthorization in 2016, we had 75 years of funding for medical surveillance and care of World Trade Center-related disorders, as well as dedicated research. As of March 31st, 2019, 95,320 first responders and survivors, the residents, school ch children, and individuals who worked in Lower Manhattan who returned to their businesses have been eva evaluated. Yes, the towers were in New York City and the Pentagon is here in DC, but it was an attack on our nation. And individuals from all over the country participated in this rescue and recovery effort. Over the past 18 years, some people have lived, have, who lived in the metro air, New York area have moved or retired to other parts of the country. Due to these reasons, there's a national component to the World Trade Center program. As of May 2019, 16,684 individuals are enrolled in the national program in every state. Downtown Manhattan, home to thousands of residents, was blanketed in thick dust. School children, like Lila sitting here, had been evacuated from their places of learning on September 11th. They returned to their schools despite fires that continued to rage and amid dust that persisted through May 2002. The survivors are also covered by the Zadroga Act, and the number of survivors has increased by 327% in eight years. Medical conditions have persisted, and that's the second wave. For example, over 50% of firefighters who worked at the World Trade Center site have developed a persistent respiratory condition. Rates of asthma remain elevated, along with a variety of other diseases. Here we are, nearly 20 years later, and unfortunately, <coughs> we've moved into the third wave of diseases, those conditions that take years to develop. We don't know a lot about the actual dust and fumes that envelop Lower Manhattan, but I'd like to reiterate that as medical professionals, <coughs> We never believed the air was safe to breathe. That is now amply clear. The World Trade Center now collects additional data on diseases that have been classified as World Trade Center related. This is crucial since early data collection on who was exposed was lacking. Further research is ongoing to determine what new diseases might be added to the approved list. Since 2012, when over 50 cancers were added to the list of World Trade Center conditions, there have been 11,824 World Trade Center certified cancers treated, including 2,614 prostate, 552 lung, 741 breast, including over, 51, over 35 male breast cancers, 667 thyroid, 571 cases of lymphoma, and hundreds more. Glioblastomas have occurred, like the one that killed Candidus Henry, a patient at the Northwell program. You will hear from his widow at, in this uh, session. The survivor program has had 3,030 individuals with cancer, and in the national program, the number of cancer cases certified increased from seven in 2013 to 708 in 2018. Nearly 20,000 children attended school below Houston Street and were exposed to over 150 toxicants in that deadly brew. Overall, over 55,000 people have cert been certified for at least one World Trade Center-related health condition in the responder and survivor programs and in the national programs. The effects from exposure of 9-11 have not only been measured in the number of deaths, cancers, lung transplants, and countless new cases of asthma. Studies have shown the impact on employment, disability, and early retirement. I'd like to briefly tell you about the impact by, hearing, by telling you about a real person. Ellie Engler, who's here today and has allowed me to give a brief description of her health issues, was a certified industrial hygien, hygienist in charge of health and safety for the United Federation of Teachers. She went into every school in Lower Manhattan and assessed the immediate health risks for staff and children. In 2008, she developed a second breast cancer, a condition she had fought and beat in 1985. She developed asthma shortly after 9-11, but it was under control. Recently, she's had severe asthma attacks that have required hospital visits. Ellie, like so many in the World Trade Center community, fought these illnesses with courage. After 2011, she also realized that all 500 staff at these schools in Lower Manhattan were eligible for the health program if they had World Trade Center conditions, and she began staff outreach. She also advocates on, beha advocates on behalf of the school children in Lower Manhattan, who have now all graduated and moved throughout this country. 
Her clinical future, like so many others, is uncertain, and she will require close monitoring and care for the rest of her life. She is truly a hero. On September 11th, 2,973 people lost their lives, including firefighters, police officers, EMS workers, and people just going to work. Since then, an additional 204 police officers, 180 FDNY firefighters, and in total, an estimated 2,000 responders and survivors have died as a result of 9-11 illnesses. With every day, these numbers increase, and soon the day will come when there are more people who died of World Trade Center-related illnesses after 9-11 than perished on that horrible day. Based on the trends we have seen in research, this third wave of 9-11 diseases will continue. Because of the monitoring program, we're able to identify new clusters of disease that will develop, such as neurological conditions, autoimmune disorders, and diseases we can't foresee. I consider myself fortunate to have been in New York City on 9-11 so I could contribute to caring for the thousands of men and women who suffered from occupational and environmental exposures from the World Trade Center dust and fumes. Being able to serve my patients and our nation as a physician involved in the World Trade Center health programs is one of the greatest honors of my life. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moline. Uh, Ms. Nordstrom. Uh, thank you to Chairman Nadler, Chairman Cohen, and Ranking Member Johnson, and the members of the committee for holding a hearing on this incredibly important issue. My name is Lila Nordstrom, and on September 11th, I was a 17-year-old student at Stuyvesant High School, which is a public school that is three blocks from the World Trade Center. On the morning of 9-11, I was in class with windows facing south, and my classmates and I watched as planes hit the Twin Towers. We watched dozens of people jumping to their deaths, we watched thousands of evacuees stream out of the area, and then the first tower fell, and a dust cloud rushed our building, and we couldn't see anything. Um, I was one of the first people out of Stuyvesant when we finally got evacuation orders, and the moment I stepped outside, the second tower collapsed, and everybody took off in a run. I walked 10 miles that day. I couldn't reach my parents. I didn't end up even going home. I ended up walking all the way to Queens. Um, after the, the attacks, we were sent to a school in Brooklyn temporarily, and the Stuyvesant building was used as a morgue and a command center for the cleanup effort at Ground Zero because of its proximity. Um, unfortunately, after EPA Administrator Christine Todd Whitman told the residents of downtown and New Yorkers that the air was safe to breathe, uh, government officials made the decision to return us to our school building, and we went back on October 9th, which is less than a month after the attacks. Ground Zero was still on fire and would be for another four months. The smell of smoke was suffocating every day, and despite assurances from officials, very little got done to clean the school for students. No hazmat team got called in. The filters in our ventilation system were not replaced until January. The air vents, which were filled with World Trade Center dust, were not cleaned until the following summer. And the auditorium's contaminated upholstery was not actually replaced fully until 2014, which you can see on the image above. Um, the school was also continually recontaminated by trucks that were carting toxic debris from the World Trade Center site past our school and dumping it into barges that were parked next to the air intake system. Testing of the air outside of our school showed that on many days it was actually as bad as the air at Ground Zero itself. And you can see where the barge was located. That picture is taken from the doors of our school. In total, more than 19,000 public school students returned to school downtown during the cleanup, as did thousands of teachers and school staff, and tens of thousands of students and professors from Borough of Manhattan Community College and Pace University and NYU. Downtown residents and office workers were actively encouraged to return, even those that had small children at home. Um, and many of them got left to clean up dangerously contaminated spaces without much guidance. Uh, the federal, federal dollars even got spent by the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation to encourage new residents to move into the area because, unsurprisingly, they began to face really high vacancy rates. Through all of this, the EPA knew that the air was not safe down there, but they did not tell us. NIOSH has now linked more than 68 cancers to the World Trade Center toxins. And I haven't even had my 20th high school reunion yet, but I already have five former classmates with lymphomas that I just know personally. My friend Michelle is in remission from thyroid cancer. Other classmates of mine have been diagnosed with rare bone cancers, testicular cancers, melanomas, 
There's even a male breast cancer survivor among us, um, as Dr. Moline was talking about earlier. Uh, classmates are also starting to die now. Uh, just a couple of months ago, Kathy Choi, who graduated just the year after me, passed away at age 33 of a 9-11 linked gastric cancer. Her VCF award has not been paid yet. When it is paid to her husband, it will be cut by 50 or 70%. And that's just my school. Uh, BMCC students are sick, as are students from Pace, and as are many younger children from the area. And beyond cancer, plenty of us are already suffering from chronic 9-11 related conditions, myself included. I'm personally certified with asthma, with GERD, with chronic rhinosinusitis, and with PTSD. So these serious illnesses that are emerging now are just the tip of the iceberg. If the VCF is allowed to close, a lot of my classmates will not find out they're sick in time to make a claim at all. And women have special reason to be concerned because most of the research that's been done on 9-11's health impacts um, has been done on the responder population, which is largely male. Uh, that means that a lot of women's health issues will not actually be linked to the attacks in time to ever be compensable through the VCF. The youngest 9-11 survivors now, we live all over the nation and we have you know, 70 or 80 years to live with these exposures in the case of the youngest exposed. Cancer does not respect arbitrary funding deadlines. And if the VCF is allowed to reduce payouts and expire, this resource that was meant to ease our suffering is gonna become just another symbol of how we were sacrificed by a government that thought a quick return to normalcy after a tragic event was more important than the health and safety of the children who lived through it. In 2011 and 2015, the government did the right thing and enacted and then reauthorized the, Z the Zadroga Act, and Congress should do the right thing one more time and fully fund and extend the VCF. My friends who get sick in 2027 deserve the same help they would have received if they'd gotten sick in 2017, and so do I. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nordstrom. Uh, we've been joined by uh, a number of the firefighters who were uh, who are, survivors, who are first responders, and I want to welcome them, and by Congressman Max Rose, who is a co-sponsor of this, of this bill. Uh, and let me, let me just say before I recognize the next witness in response to what uh, Ms. Nordstrom just said, as I said before, there are really two moral responsibilities. Uh, plenty of people got sick and will get sick because of what the terrorists did on 9-11. Plenty of people got sick and will get sick because of what the federal government did in the days following. I remember very clearly uh, the EPA administrators saying, go back, to, go back to work, let's get things back to normal, everything's fine. I remember the, the mayor at the time saying, reopen Stuyvesant, et cetera. I was calling for, for parents not to send their kids back to Stuyvesant. I was telling people not to go back to Wall Street, not to go back to work, because it was very evident that it wasn't clear. But the federal government bears a heavy moral responsibility for what happened. And this bill is only, a, if we pass it, when we pass it, I, I hope, be a very, very small partial uh, repayment for that moral obligation. Uh, Ms. Rose Henry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Um, Can you use Johnson? your mic, please? Pardon? Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ernesto Centros Henry. My husband died a few, a few weeks ago of 9-11 related brain cancer. My husband's candidate was only 52 years old when he died. He missed our son's prom. Which was last week and he missed out on our fantastic search for our jacket for him because the one we, he, we, we bought was too small <laughs> and too short. Um, oh my God. So after that, we were able to get a jacket for our, um, for our son, and I just missed my husband because we would have a good laugh at that jacket, the way it fitted him. Oh, Candace was the, was, the, was the, oh God. He was the life of my family. Um, oh God. He will not be there for my son's graduation, which will be on the 19th of this month, and many other kids his age, 
the par that, that lost the parents. He, the parents will not be there for that. And also my daughter, his only daughter, wedding, we, we do not know what day is that, but he will not be there to walk her down the aisle. So not, so not to have to make that, oh God. Oh God. So not only to have, do I have to make up for his missing present, but I have to be worried about whether we will have enough money for our son college and living expense. The reason I have to worry is because Congress thinks it is okay for my husband's life to be worth at least 70% 70, 70 less than what other construction workers have had died of before, before coming sick from being at ground zero. If he died two years ago, everything would be okay. I feel horrible for those that live. Oh God. I feel horrible for those that will die two years from now because of the family as well. Oh God. I feel horrible for those who will die two years from now because of the family will not get nothing. Candace was a construction worker and a proud man, husband, father, son. He wanted to, he went to work every day. When he was assigned to Ground Zero, he was also a proud American. His job at Ground Zero was to wash the, the, the dust and debris from the trucks before they left for the camp and to make sure everything was secure and nothing was taken out. They wanted they wanted to be sure human remains were not going to fall off the trucks on their way to the bucket. While his job, while his job may, may not sound glorious, he was proud of it and proud to say he worked at Ground Zero. After his time at Ground Zero ended, he worked every day as a construction labor and raised, his, raised our family. We are not rich and we live from paycheck to paycheck, always with some sort of credit card bills. Although he left Ground Zero in 2002, 15 years later, Ground Zero came back to him. Candidus was, well, was diagnosed with glioblastoma and a rare brain cancer. We were told it was extremely rare. We then learn that there are many 9-11 responders with the same cancer. Glioblastoma is a death, a death sentence in which it took two years, in, and it took two years, in, and it took two years. It eventually killed Candidus. It took his mind a few months before his death, and while he, we took care of him for the last few months, we was, he was already gone. My son would come home, from school and my daughter from work and would say hi dad and there was only a glaze and sometimes there was nothing. He only wanted to talk to his dad about his day and that was gone. When Canada got sick, that ended the paycheck and benefit. Thankfully the World Trade Center Health Program picked up all of the expense for his care and treatment. They, they were wonderful at Queen's program, and we wouldn't have survived without them. We were also able to get out, to get some help from the VCR, and receive an award for his cancer. They worked so quickly to get that for us because they knew he was dying. Thank you for them for that. Please do not cancel them. They are very good. They help us very well. <laughs> But, but now for Candidus gone, but now that Candidus is gone, we do not know what is going to happen. We do not have life insurance. We do not have a pen, we do not have a pension for any for a pension or any benefit from his job. Not even his death benefit we got. Our only hope was the VCR, and now we do not know if there will be much from them now, because he died after. February 2nd, which was also his birthday, 2009, we will get at least 70% less than others that die sooner. My husband was a proud man and never looked down on others or thought that he was better or his life was worth more 
than that. But I can tell you that his life is not worthless than anyone else. And I knew my husband would be proud to be here in person than I talking to him, because we should have to recognize these people at work down there because they are more important than anything else. They were the ones who pick up everything else, and now that he's gone, we do not know what we are going to do without him. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ms. St. Rose Henry, and let me say that we are here today to help make sure that Congress does not think it's okay that your husband's life is worth 70% less than other construction workers or than anyone else's. I thank you for your testimony. I will help in that goal. Mr. Mo Monell. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. My name is Thomas Monell, and I began my career with the Federal Bureau of Investigation on January 3rd, 1980, and retired on May 30th, 2010, as a supervisory special agent, explosive and hazardous device examiner in the explosives unit of the FBI laboratory. In the moments after the Pentagon was attacked, I became what is known as a 9-11 first responder. Just like others sitting with me today, we did our job and we did it uh, well beyond 100%. We did everything we could do to rescue those that were trapped and we did everything we could to find those who were missing so their families could have the closure that they desperately needed. Like everyone else here today and all other first responders, I will never forget 9-11 and I always knew it would be with me. What I didn't know was what that would mean some 15 years later to me and my family. On 9-11, I was working at FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C., and after the second plane hit the World Trade Center, I was directed to go to New York City in response to the FBI laboratory. I departed headquarters en route to my residence in Manassas, Virginia, and I was traveling on I-395 South when I was directly across from the Pentagon in stop traffic at approximately 9.37 a.m. I witnessed American Airlines Flight 77 crashing into the Pentagon. I immediately notified our headquarters that a plane had crashed into the Pentagon and immediately responded to the crash site and started lending assistance to victims in the area. FBI agents and members of the evidence response teams from Washington field office began arriving very quickly, fully aware that the life-saving and investigative activities that they would undertake in response to this terrorist attack could put their lives in danger. Evidence response teams from Baltimore, Richmond, Norfolk, Charlotte, and Atlanta also deployed to the Pentagon. On August 4th, I was diagnosed with follicular non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I was certified by the World Trade Center Health Program and received excellent care and regular physicals through that excellent program. I am here today to ask Congress why they believe that my life is not worth the same as those that became sick before me and how my life could be worth more than those that will most certainly become ill after me. It doesn't care who you are, what you did, or when you did it. The guidelines are fair and based on the exposure and your illness, then the compensation is based on the economic loss and of that particular illness. The special master over the years has done a great job on managing a program fairly and equally in the face of illness, death, and despair. Now, because so many people are becoming sick and the funds are running out, the special master is being forced to look at cases through different lenses based on when the forms were filed. That means that our lives and illness now have a different value and meaning. I've had the pleasure to come to the Capitol on several occasions now with the Feel Good Foundation to walk the halls of Congress to ask for support for the 9-11 first responders in the Victim Compensation Fund. I have learned that every member in Congress have praised the work of first responders in the 9-11 first responders. I've learned that on September 11th, every member of Congress pauses in remembrance of those that were lost that day and those that we will continue to lose. I have also learned that every member of Congress promises to never forget. I am here to support our colleagues that have become sick in the past and those that will become sick in the future. There are people in this room right now that will become sick from their 9-11 exposure and die. 
their families will need the support beyond the wards, never forget. Congress has the ability to fix this problem. Nearly every FBI evidence response team in the country deployed to one of the attack sites to sift through thousands of contaminated debris looking for any shred of evidence that may lend assistance in this investigation. Passport fragments were found of the hijackers to include the knives that were actually used in the attacks were recovered from crash sites. This shows the extreme dedication the workers had while sifting through contaminated debris, knowing all along that this could possibly affect their health. Many thousands of Americans, first responders, firefighters, police officers, and volunteers have been diagnosed with severe health conditions, including cancer, in the wake of the attacks. Knowing the type of individuals that sacrifice their health, and in many cases their lives, they would all do the same job all over again for this country. This is a nationwide issue, and it must be fixed by our leaders in Congress together, as there are no state lines for a 9-11 illness. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. O'Connell. Good morning. Lieutenant O'Connell. My name is Michael O'Connell, and I'm a retired lieutenant from the New York City Fire Department. I want to personally thank Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Co Collins, and the committee members for allowing me to be here today at this hearing to tell my story, which is really no different from the thousands of others who suffer from their heroic actions. Today, I can say thank you to the countless selfless heroes, volunteers, survivors, and those affected at the three terrorist sites because I get the best health care treatment and I've been compensated by the September 11th Victims Compensation Fund. I was just a 25-year-old probationary firefighter on that beautiful Tuesday morning of the 11th without a clue as to what was happening. I had just transferred from the NYPD in May of 2001 and was not even graduated from the FDNY Fire Academy on that horrific day. When the towers were struck, I was home on Long Island and immediately raced into ladder 129 in Flushing, Queens, where I was doing my field training. Within minutes of my arrival, we started to respond to Lower Manhattan. During our response, I was, we were notified of the collapse of the South Tower of the World Trade Center, and a fellow firefighter turned to me and said, do you realize how many guys we just lost? The truth was, I didn't have a clue, but I would learn quickly. Upon arrival, we went to work right away in the war zone, later known as Ground Zero. We were given many tasks and tried our best to search for human life, but unfortunately, we weren't very successful. Countless hours we spent digging by hand. To this day, there is really only one memory etched into my brain, and one that still haunts me to this, to this day and every night. As firefighters, we wear scot packs that are equipped with pass alarms. Pass alarms are meant to go off when a firefighter is laid motionless, making a screeching sound so you can go find them. Well, for the first few minutes of our arrival and the countless hours that passed, that's all we heard. That was our brothers trapped beneath the pile of concrete and steel, and we cannot get to them. It is a difficult memory, but one that keeps me going. It reminds me that those men and women who gave their lives that day were selfless, and I try my best to live my life to that standard every day. In the midst of the chaos and loss of life, I can tell you that there are, there's another thought that I had. I would not want to be anywhere else in the world at that moment. We were there to help, and I was part of something that showed the world that we would not back down to anyone. We helped bring closure to families and that just wanted something tangible, some part that remained to bury. Now it is your turn. You were not there on the pile with us, but what you do in this moment is as important as what we did at Ground Zero. I had, the, I had Worked the pile for days and weeks that, filed, that followed, with very little protection in the dust cloud, and I would later pay the ultimate price. The change came on January 1st of 2007 when I woke up and instantly knew something was wrong. I couldn't get out of bed, and it felt like somebody came into the room that night and beat me up with a baseball bat. My ankles, my legs, my feet were so swollen it made it difficult to even walk to the car to get to the doctor. I was put through a series of tests, and from what the doctors had seen, the prognosis did not look good. My wife, Rebecca, who was six months pregnant with our first child, was escorted to a conference room where the team of doctors waited for us to give us the news and told us that this looked like an advanced case of lymphoma and that I most likely didn't have much time to live. At this point, all I wanted to do was make it long enough to see the birth of my first child. 
It's obvious since I'm testifying here today and by the grace of God, I'm able to be here to tell my story. I'm a proud father of three beautiful children named Aiden, Colton, and Alexandra, all of which witnessed their father battle 9-11 illnesses from the time they were born. I was very fortunate that the original prognosis was wrong. I was actually diagnosed with a rare autoimmune disease called sarcoidosis. I was one of the youngest and first firefighters diagnosed with sarcoid, but hundreds more have been diagnosed since. I spent the, few, the next few months in recovery, and with the proper treatments, I was able to get back on my feet. Sadly, I cannot say that about others. My career in the FDNY that I was so passionate about was cut short, and 9-11 ensured I would be unable to continue as a full-duty firefighter as I was deemed disabled. I was on pace to advance through the FDNY as a senior officer, but I was unable to finish that dream of protecting the greatest city in the world. I ask you all respectfully, how is it fair that I was duly compensated, but others that are now sick and dying from their exposure will not be? It seems unfair that I was lucky enough to get sick, but, but lucky that I got sick early enough so that I could avoid potential cut, or worse, having no VCF as of December 2020. How is my, fi my family financially safe for a lifetime, but the families of those not diagnosed are left hanging? These people are getting sick 18 years later and are not going to receive the same benefits as those who got sick before them because they are un unlucky to get sick at a time when the VCF is running out of funds. I speak today in tribute to the 343 firefighters, the 23 NYPD, and the 37 Port Authority police officers that didn't make it out on September 11, 2001, and to the thousands who are still sick and who are dying, and especially for my brother Ray Pfeiffer from the FDMY who is no longer with us. I promise myself to keep fighting for my family and for those who are sick or have passed and yet to be compensated because one day I might not be here to tell my story, but there will be someone else to follow and continue the tradition, a tradition that is rich in history and a tradition where no one is left behind. In closing, I have made countless trips to the hill with the men and women who sit behind me. We came together to join forces on the Feel Good Foundation team from all walks of life, cops, firefighters, construction workers, correction officers, civilians, lawyers, students, widows, with one common goal. We are simply imploring this committee to extend and refund the VCF so that thousands of people across this great nation get the help that they deserve and they have earned. Thank you for your time today, Chairman, Ranking Members, and the committee. God bless you, God bless all those sitting behind me, and God bless America. Thank you very much, uh, Lieutenant. Uh, Detective Alvarez. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Los Alvarez, and I'm a retired NYPD detective from the bomb squad and a proud military veteran. Less than 24 hours from now, I will be starting my 69th round of chemotherapy. Yeah, you, you heard that correct. I should not be here with you, but you made me come. You made me come because I will not stand by and watch as my friends with cancer from 9-11, like me, are valued less than anyone else because of when they get sick they die. I have been lucky enough to have had 68 rounds of chemo. Yeah, you, you heard me right, 68 rounds. Many others haven't had the opportunity to have five, and some have had none. Their families would love to have time with them that made mine have time with me because I have been lucky enough to have the pain and suffering of 69 rounds of chemo and countless other treatments and surgeries. It is my goal and it is my legacy to see that you do the right thing for all 
9-11 responders. Please understand that we are not here for anything for ourselves. We became police officers, firefighters, paramedics to help others. We went to ground zero for Pentagon and Shanksville to help people first and then help their families bury someone or something. We were there with one mission and we left after completing that mission. I have been to many places in this world. Excuse me. And done many things. But I can tell you that I did not want to be anywhere else but ground zero when I was there. We were part of showing the world that we would never back down from terrorism and that we could all work together. No races, no colors, no politics. Now that the 9-11 illnesses have taken many of us and we are all worried about our children and spouses and our families if we are not here. The, VS, the VCF has done a wonderful job and treated my family with greatest respect. But my life isn't worth more than the next responder to get cancer. My family needs are not worth less than any others who have already died. This fund is not a ticket to paradise. It is there to provide for our families when we can't. Nothing more. You all said you would never forget. Well, I'm here to make sure that you don't. You made me come down here the day before my 69th round of chemo. And I'm going to make sure that you never forget to take care of the 9-11 responders. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Detective Alvarez. Uh, Mr. Stewart. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Collins and Mr. Naylor for putting this together, but uh, as I sit here today, I can't help but think what an incredible metaphor this room is for the entire process that getting health care and benefits for 9-11 first responders has come to. Behind me, a filled room of 9-11 first responders, and in front of me, a nearly empty Congress. Sick and dying, they brought themselves down here to speak to no one. It's shameful. It's an embarrassment to the country, and it is a stain on this institution. And you should be ashamed of yourselves for those that aren't here, but you won't be. Because accountability doesn't appear to be something that occurs in this chamber. We don't want to be here. Lou doesn't want to be here. None of these people want to be here. But they are, and they're not here for themselves. They're here to continue fighting for what's right. 
Lou's going to go back for his 69th chemo. The great Ray Pfeiffer would come down here, his body riddled with cancer and pain, where he couldn't walk. And the disrespect shown to him and to the other lobbyists on this bill is utterly unacceptable. You know, I used to get, I, I, would, I would be so angry at the latest injustice that's done to these men and women. And, uh, you know, another business card thrown our way uh, as a way of, of shooing us away. Like children, trick-or-treating, rather than the heroes that they are and will always be. Ray would say, calm down, Johnny, calm down. I got all the cards I need. And he would tap his pocket. where he kept the prayer cards for 343 firefighters. The official FDNY response time to 9-11 was five seconds. Five seconds. That's how long it took for FDNY, for NYPD, for Port Authority, for EMS, to respond to an urgent need from the public. Five seconds. Hundreds died in an instant. Thousands more poured in to continue to fight for their brothers and sisters. The breathing problem started almost immediately. And they were told they weren't sick, they were crazy. And then, as the illnesses got worse and things became more apparent, well, okay, you're sick, but it's not from the pile. And then, when the science became irrefutable, okay, it's the pile. But this is a New York issue. I don't know if we have the money. And I'm sorry if I sound angry and undiplomatic, but I'm angry, and you should be too, and they're all angry as well, and they have every justification to be that way. There is not a person here, there is not an empty chair on that stage that didn't tweet out, never forget the heroes of 9-11. Never forget their bravery. Never forget what they did, what they gave to this country. Well, here they are. And where are they? And it would be one thing if their callous indifference and rank hypocrisy were benign, but it's not. Your indifference cost these men and women their most valuable commodity, time. It's the one thing they're running out of. This should be flipped. This hearing should be flipped. These men and women should be up on that stage and Congress should be down here answering their questions as to why this is so damn hard and takes so damn long. And why no matter what they get, something's always pulled back and they gotta come back. Mr. Johnson, you, you, you made a point earlier and it was one that we have heard over and over again in these halls and I, 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 I couldn't help but to answer to it, which was, you said, look, you know, you guys are obviously heroes and 9-11 was a big deal, but you know, we have a lot of stuff here to do. And, uh, you know, we gotta make sure there's money for a variety of uh, uh, disasters, hurricanes and tornadoes. But this wasn't a hurricane. And this wasn't a tornado. And by the way, that's your job anyway. We can't fund these programs, you can. Setting aside that no American in this country should face financial ruin because of uh, a health issue. 
Certainly 9-11 first responders shouldn't have to decide whether to live or to have a place to live. And the idea that you can only give them five more years of the VCF because you're not quite sure what's going to happen five years from now, well, I can tell you, I'm pretty sure what's going to happen five years from now. More of these men and women are going to get sick and they are going to die. And I am awfully tired of hearing that it's a 9-11 New York issue. Al-Qaeda didn't shout death to Tribeca. They attacked America and these men and women and their response to it is what brought our country back. It's what gave a reeling nation a solid foundation to stand back upon, to remind us of why this country is great, of why this country is worth fighting for, and you are ignoring them. And you can end it tomorrow. Why this bill isn't unanimous consent and a standalone issue is beyond my comprehension. And I have yet to hear a reasonable explanation for why. It'll get stuck in some transportation bill or some appropriations bill and get sent over to the Senate where a certain someone from the Senate will use it as a political football to get themselves maybe another new import tax on petroleum. Because that's what happened to us in 2015. And we won't allow it to happen again. Thank God for people like John Field. Thank God for people like Ray Pfeiffer. Thank God for all of these people who will not let it happen. They responded in five seconds. They did their jobs with courage, grace, tenacity, humility. 18 years later, do yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. We'll now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions. I'll begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, Ms. Bhattacharya, what are some of the factors that have led to the increase in the number of claims that the VCF has seen over the last year, and how should these factors inform Congress's decision-making as it determines how best, whether and how best to reauthorize the VCF? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the question. There have been, I think, four major changes uh, in the VCF over the last few years from what Congress saw when it last reauthorized this bill in 2015 and allocated the $7.375 billion. The first is that the total number of claims that have been filed has increased significantly. In the first five years of the fund, from 2011 to 2016, we had just over 19,000 compensation forms filed. In the last two and a half years, we've received 28,000 more. And the reasons for those, I think, are three. The first is that there is a significant increase in the number of claims being filed on behalf of victims who have died as a result of their 9-11 related conditions. As we get further away from the attacks, but as the seriousness of the illnesses become more apparent, we see more and more of these claims. At the end of 2015, we had just 600 deceased claims. We now have well over 2,000 of them. The second thing is that the number of claimants with cancer conditions continues to increase. We have found over 8,800 claimants eligible because of a cancer condition, and we have made over 7 1,500 awards due to cancers. Um, in 2015, we had seen only a fraction of that number. And the third is that we are seeing a substantial increase in claims filed by the survivor community. 
those who lived, worked, or went to school in the area. In the first five years of the program, survivor claims were just 14% of the awards that were made. Now they account for almost 40% of the claims that are being filed. And we think that's due to two things. The first are the increase in cancer rates, and the second is that the VCF suffered from a significant information gap in the early years of the program. Many, many people in the New York area were under the assumption that the program was only for first responders. And as we have been able to do more outreach, as the World Trade Center Health Program has been able to do more outreach, partly because of the reauthorization of the bill in 2015, we have been able to reach more people who are sick, more people who are dying, and those claims are now coming in. Thank you. And in your written testimony, you note that in determining the amount of non-economic loss for a claimant, collateral offsets must be subtracted in full from any reduced award amount. In light of this, is it possible that some claimants may in fact end up with no money, despite the fact that they are legally entitled to money from the VCF? So, yes, Congressman, yeah. that yes. is possible. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Moline, how many more people do you think could be at risk of developing 9-11 related illnesses, including cancers, in the next 25 to 50 years? And is it possible to know the exact number of people who develop illnesses at this point in time? It's not possible to know the exact number but based on the rates that are increasing, there are gonna be 10 to 20,000 more cancers, I would estimate. 10 to 20,000 more cancers? Yes. Plus other diseases? Plus other diseases, and as we heard about sarcoidosis, which is a fairly rare disease, but is common in World Trade Center exposed individuals. Um, we're going to see folks who have lung diseases that may require lung transplants. There have already been a number of individuals in the World Trade Center health programs that have required lung transplants due to uh, scarring of the lungs from the glass and the, the concrete and everything else that uh, caused a reaction in their lungs. So as an order of magnitude, you said, what, about 30, 40,000 maybe? You know, it's, it's hard to predict, but based on the rates and the number of folks that were exposed, it, that number is, is accurate. Thank you. Ms. Nordstrom, while the terrorists who carried out the attacks against the United States on 9-11 bear the ultimate responsibility for all the harms caused by the attacks, you note the federal government's responsibility in heightening the risk to responders and members of the community in the days after the attacks. In particular, the EPA at the time gave false assurances that the air around Ground Zero was, quote, safe to breathe, assurances for which the then EPA administrator has since apologized and acknowledged were wrong. As a matter of moral responsibility, do you agree that Congress, as representatives of the American people, should help to give some measure of compensation to victims for the harms they have suffered that were exacerbated by the government's own actions at the time? Um, I think they absolutely should. I mean, I'm sitting before you as someone who was present on 9-11, but I was not caught in the dust cloud. There is no reason that my respiratory health or my gastrointestinal health or my, you know, my, uh, I guess that's also my respiratory health, but there's no reason that that should have been impacted by the events of 9-11. I only have these conditions because I was sent back and I was only sent back because the federal government assured New Yorkers that the air downtown was safe to breathe. I was a child at the time. I was in no position to make that decision for myself. I was not only, you know, following the sort of wishes of, my, of the adults in my life, but also the wishes of the government, which at every level seemed to assure us that we were going to be fine in an environment where we were surrounded by dust and debris and fires would burn for another four months. Thank you. My time has expired. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you. Um, there are too few issues today that draw everybody in Congress together, this is one of them. And Ms. Stewart, listen, I, what you said is exactly right. I, I would not interpret some of the empty chairs as indifference. We, by, by virtue of its jurisdiction, this is a subcommittee of House Judiciary. If it was the full committee, you'd have many more members here. But because we're a subcommittee, sometimes we get, um, the, the scheduling gets crossed with other larger full committee hearings, and some of them are there this morning, and they sent regrets. But. We're going to make them all watch this tape uh, because the testimony was so compelling. And um, I've been in politics a while. I can't recall uh, being so moved by a testimony as I was today. I cried through most of this. All of us did. It's just uh, incomprehensible 
what the terrorists did to our nation and, and the, the harm that it continues to inflict. So if it is any comfort to you all, we know this bill is going to pass with a overwhelming landslide majority of the House, maybe unanimous or close to it, and it should be. Yeah, I will. I will. Um, as I said in my opening statement, I mean, I'm, I'm the son of a disabled, permanently injured first responder myself. My dad was a fire captain, and so I get it. I know what you've been through, and that's why it was so painful to hear your personal stories, because I've, I've lived it myself. So I get that. Um, as I said in the opening remarks, just as we do with everything, we, we want to do the fair and just thing. We want to compensate everyone. But we also have a fiscal responsibility thing that we have to be mindful of the whole time, and that's, that's the only question. And so I, I just have one question, Miss um, um, uh, Bhattacharya. So the CBO can't give us a score on this. They won't. We're marking it up tomorrow. It's going to pass committee. It'll be, I think it's going to sail through. But has your office done any kind of estimate on total cost of what this will be ultimately? So, Congressman, we've done projections about what we expect the total cost would have been had we not done reduced awards for claims expected to be filed through December 18th, 2020, which is the current sunset date. We believe that we would need about $12 billion um, to compensate all of the claims expected to be filed by that date, which is about $5 billion more than we currently have. We have not done any projections beyond that closing date. We're, would the gentleman yield for a moment? Sure. Yeah, I just want to say uh, CBO is scoring the bill. They are. Okay. They are scoring. We don't know, and they don't know when they'll have a score, but they are scoring oh, wow. it. It'll be after the fact, but that's fine. I don't uh, know how to do this, but it, can I add to that point? I'll yield to you, sure. If I may? Sure. Uh, thank you for yielding. We uh, have to, John. We have to. I bend a knee to you. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, the price, uh, the attacks on 9-11 have been used in our government to justify all measure of policy and spending to the tune of trillions of dollars. Uh, just recently, uh, there was a farm bill that was $25 billion that helps farmers uh, that are in need uh, based on policies that are beyond their control. And, and I believe our government should do that. This is less than half of that, a third of that. There was a corporate tax cut that was made by our Congress, uh, and so it, it's very difficult for us to hear. Geez, I don't know. You know, we're we're tight. We're tight on money right now. You know, it's it's a little cool because it's it's hard for me to understand that Exxon has a more urgent need than our first responder community. No, nobody so, believes that. I mean, but, me, but it's yeah. when when you talk about fiscal responsibility, you talk about priorities, and priorities mean actions and not deeds, and. The priority of words from this Congress is always that character and patriotism are the priority and that we all must be willing to pay the price of freedom. This is the price. And when we show up with the bill, you cannot take a proverbial knee. No, you're right. Look, I got 30 seconds left. Let me reclaim the time because that's what we do on yes, this sir. procedure. I agree with you. And I'm, I'm telling you that the action is going to follow the rhetoric, and you're going to get it from virtually. No, you're right. You shouldn't have to be here. You should not have to be here. The only question is, if we authorize it to 2090, do, do we have any idea what that's going to cost? Just because we need to know because we're doing budgeting, not because it's not the top priority and should be, John. We're just saying, to be good fiscal stewards of all this, do we even have a, an idea of what that ultimate number may be? And I'll leave it. Just That's the final question. You know, the, the problem is, I think, as Dr. Moline has described, is there's, there's no way for us to know how many people were exposed. CBO originally estimated somewhere between 685 and 500,000 people. And there's no way for us to know how many of those exposed will actually get sick, partly because of the latency periods associated with cancer. And so, unfortunately, I, we have not been able to make those projections beyond December 18th, 2020. I just want to say, even if it's an, I'm done, Mr. Chairman, I'm out of time, but even if it's an astronomical number, it is a responsibility of the government. We know that. The question is, can we just figure out what that number is? And that's it. Now, I'll yield back. I'm out of time. Thank let, you all. Let me, uh, I, I thank the gentleman for yielding back. Let me, let me just point out uh, on, on, on time, I will assume. Um, 
The terrorists declared war on us. When we declare war on somebody, whether it's Japan in 1941 or, or Al-Qaeda now, we don't have a cost estimate. We don't have a time estimate. We don't have a cost estimate. We just say we have to do it. And we'll have some sort of cost estimate. It may not be accurate. Who knows? I mean, when you're talking about, but this is part of a war that was declared on us, and we have to do it. And the cost estimate may follow, may not. It probably, it, CBO will guess. They will give us a, a, a cost. It'll be a pure guess. I don't know how accurate that'll be. They don't know either. But it doesn't matter. Um, this is part of a war, and it's part of something we have to do, and we'll do it. Uh, the gentleman from Tennessee, the chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate each and every one of you who have worked on this issue and worked at 9-11. Your testimony, Mr. Alvarez, Lieutenant McConnell, everybody here has been touching. It's told a story. It will be ex relayed to members of Congress and to the public through the media and through word of mouth. This is an American tragedy. It was an attack on America, and you did your jobs. Thank you. The New York Fire Department is an institution that I think we all in America hold in high regard. NYFD hats are everywhere because people respect what the fire department did going into those towers and sacrificing their lives and continuing to go through the debris and look for survivors. So it will be done. Mr. Johnson well expressed the fact that we'll pass this bill and we will get it done. I'm going to defend an institution that is sometimes not easy to defend, but is the bulwark of democracy, and that's the United States Congress. And the United States Congress is a good body that represents people in their districts and comes together. It doesn't always come together and express itself in policies that I agree with, and I don't get everything I want, but you get something. You work together. This is a subcommittee of a committee. My subcommittee, every single member on my side, which is eight of us, have been here today. Some, like Ms. Garcia said, I have a financial services committee. We have other committees at the same time. Some members are in their offices visiting with constituents, or they may be watching on television because this is broadcast. But the subcommittee is only eight members, including Mr. Nadler, who's ex officio of all the subcommittees on my side, and I think five on Mr. Johnson's side. And I know Mr. Collins was here, and he's a sponsor of the bill. Our attendance was pretty good. All these empty chairs, that's because it's for the full committee. It's not because of disrespect or lack of attention to you. That's not true. And we will respond and we will see that this is funded. Now, Mr. Stewart, I appreciate what you've done and what you do and what you said. But the Congress will respond in spite of the fact that we spent trillions of dollars on tax breaks for corporations and the wealthiest people in this country, most many of whom are on the Upper East Side many of whom are living in expensive, expensive places and didn't need the tax cut. That's where the money should be. And there's a lot of money that ought to go into research on diseases and the National Institutes of Health to keep all of us as alive that we're not giving because we're spending it on defense projects, some of which are not necessary because they're being spent for the producers of the weapons and not to defend America. We need budget priorities and budget sense but it comes together in a majority. And there is an issue that Mr. Johnson raises about fiscal responsibility. We gave it away last year when we passed that tax bill. We gave the upper one half of 1% monies they didn't need. People who you were fighting to protect and work for. So, you know, I'm not happy with Congress with that bill. I voted against it. I call it a tax scam, and I believe it was. But I will work for you, and I will work for people who have sickness and disease 
and who fight for others and sacrifice themselves and don't make six-figure salaries because that's we need to look upon people who are just getting from day to day and trying to help others. And the police and the fire departments do that. And Mr. Alvarez, thank you so much for being here. And God bless you. God bless you. And I yield back the balance of my time. <clears throat> Gentlemen from Maryland, Mr. Raskin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the first thing I want to say is that the, the title of the legislation is Never Forget the Heroes, Permanent Authorization of the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund. And uh, I am delighted to be a strong supporter of the legislation, a co-sponsor of the legislation. And I am uh, especially delighted after hearing the incredibly powerful and poignant testimony of our witnesses today that the word permanent is in there because the people in this room today made a permanent, lifelong commitment to the community of America when they went to rescue, to help, to assist. Um, and we need to make a permanent, lifelong commitment to the people in this room um, not five years, not 10 years, but for as long as we have them with us, we must be committed to them. Um, something that Mr. Stewart said reminded me of this essay that I once read by George Orwell, who contrasted patriotism and nationalism. And he said, patriotism is about a true devotion to your community, to your neighbors, to your friends, to your family, to the values, to your constitution, to the community. Um, that's what patriotism is. Nationalism is just about sinking your individuality into some mythic military hole to go to war against people from other countries. And the people in the room today are real patriots. And we've got to be patriots too, Mr. Chairman, We've got to pass this legislation to demonstrate that we really do take care of our own people and we are really devoted to the community that is America. Maybe they were victims of misfortune the day that those 18 hijackers, most of them uh, Saudis, um, pumped up with religious hatred uh, and extremism and zealotry came to attack our country. So maybe they were victims of misfortune, but if today they're not getting the health care that they need, they are not just victims of misfortune, they are victims of an injustice perpetrated by our government. And life is hard enough on our people with all of the misfortune, with the sickness, the illness, the injury, the accident, that the government should not be compounding the misfortunes of life with the injustice of denying people the health care that they need and that they should be receiving in the richest society that ever existed at the richest moment that it was ever in existence. So we're going to make this happen. Ms. Nordstrom, I want to ask you a question. Um, your story is very poignant to me. You're, you're describing what happened to school children who were sent back to the neighborhood when it was no longer safe. And now you describe how many of your classmates are coming down with asthma and cancer and fatal diseases, and you've already lost some of them. And you're, I think you described being at your 20th reunion. Is that right? Or, uh, not even my 20th not reunion. Not even. That's in a few years. Okay. But how, how does... America, or how does the city keep track of people in your situation? Who reached out to you? I assume that the fire departments and the police departments have a way of communicating with people, but who's keeping track of people in your situation? That's been incredibly challenging, and one of the reasons that this fund closing, when it does, will really be harmful for us is that a lot of people in my situation are not aware that they qualify for these services. A lot of the coverage of, this, um, of, of these services gets directed at responders, and because of that, a lot of survivors, especially those outside of the city, and we live nationally dispersed. I live in California. I, I, I do not live in New York City. I haven't for 12 years. Um, a, a lot of us uh, don't have 
you know, local advocates on this issue. There's no local press coverage of this issue. And so there's a large group of people that may already be sick who just aren't aware that these services are available to them, who aren't familiar with how to apply to them. We have really had to rely on word of mouth pretty extensively. Um, and considering that a lot of the students who were present in Lower Manhattan during the cleanup were not actually residents of the neighborhood, Stuyvesant has 3,000 students and most of them do not live in Lower Manhattan. There is a similarly large high school who also doesn't serve a resident population a couple blocks away. Um, there are a lot of specialized schools in that area. A lot of them, do because a lot of people's parents didn't live in the area, um, they weren't even informed about these risks. They weren't informed about these services. And so we're still doing the work of reaching out to them now. One final question. This is not a problem that affects only the people in New York. There are people who've left New York or other parts of the country, but also we weren't just hit in New York. We were hit down here in our area at the Pentagon. We were hit in Pennsylvania. But Mr. Stewart, let me come to you since I know you've been such a zealous advocate for the people in the room. How do we get all of America to understand this is a national problem? This doesn't affect just one isolated community geographically. I'm pretty sure all of America does understand that. I think. Our problem has been with the part of America that represents America. Our problem has been with the Congress and not with the American people. It's not like the support for this community isn't out there. Our problem has been that there are oftentimes just a lot of excuses. Look, it takes an incredible amount of effort from these men and women to come down here. It, I've been at this for 10 years with them. John Field's been at it for, I don't know, 14. And they're, and they're down here hundreds of times, spending thousands of hours. It's not hard to convince the American people that this is a no-brainer and a worthy cause. Our problem has been in these chambers, and I'm sorry that it's not meant as an attack on the grand institution of democracy. It's meant as a dumbfounded, shrug of, I can't understand why this has been so hard and why every time we take one step forward, something gets withheld. We've been to too many funerals, man, too many hospitals, too many hospices, and it's gonna keep going. And I, I think we're just at the end of the rope. Thank you for your advocacy, Mr. Chairman. I yield back and I excuse myself only to go to the floor of the House to introduce legislation. Thank you. Thank the gentleman, the uh, uh, gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Scanlon. Okay. Before I begin, I want to say thank you to all of the witnesses. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your stories. I also want to say that I'm sorry, not just for the loss and the grief that you've endured, and, and those are obviously profound, but I'm sorry that you have to be here again to plead your case to reauthorize the Victims' Compensation Fund, a decision that, as Mr. Stewart says, should be a no-brainer. Um, I've, this case is, or this cause is close to my heart. I've followed it over the years uh, for a couple reasons. My father-in-law, Red Stewart, was a volunteer firefighter in New Jersey for over 50 years. My brother-in-law is a medic and a lieutenant in a Rhode Island fire department. I've got several other office, or relatives who are sworn police officers. And while I'm not a New Yorker, um, as a resident of southeastern Pennsylvania, when the terrorist acts on 9-11 occurred, it felt a little bit like we were in the eye of a hurricane because things were unfolding to the north of us in New York, to the south of us in D.C., and to the west of us in Shanksville. And friends, neighbors, and relatives were impacted, whether because they were at one of those sites or because they lost loved ones. But the shock and horror of those events um, were really surpassed by the bravery, grace, and humanity of the first responders, many of whom are here, some of whom we lost, and everyday Americans as they responded uh, to that tragedy. So it's that humanity that demands that Congress address this issue once and for all, and that's why I'm a co proud co-sponsor of the bill. Um, as a new member of Congress, one who ran because of anger, over why things that seem so obvious um, aren't getting done. I, I hear you, and, and I look forward to swift passage of uh, permanent reauthorization of this bill. 
Um, just a couple quick questions. Uh, Lieutenant O'Connell, um, you've already received your award from the VCF. Why are you here to testify today about this? I'm here because I did receive my award and I've seen people fall sick and die right in front of me that haven't. I believe we lost about 20 something people last month that their families, we have to sit there in front of them, somebody who actually has a wife and three children at home knowing that they're taken care of. And I'm looking at somebody else's wife and children and they don't know where their future lies. And that's why I'm here. And that's the common humanity that says we should pass this. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. The, gen the other gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to be here today, as heartbreaking as uh, the stories are. Uh, and please understand uh, that I, too, am a new member of Congress. Uh, I, too, am baffled that we're even having this conversation or that we force you to come here and, and share your heartbreak. Uh, some of you not well, struggling for your own uh, health. Uh, so don't misinterpret. If you see people coming in and out of here, some of us have other hearings. We're just trying to balance and do the work of, of both. Do not misinterpret that we do not care. We care. We think this is a grievous wrong that you have to come and ask for reauthorization. It's an absolute, insane, grievous wrong, and we get it. And this new majority, I believe, will take action. I wanted to start with Ms. Henry. Uh, I think you are joined by your children behind you. I, I see the heartbreak in them and the pictures they carry. And I, I have to tell you, I, I was so touched by the way you talked about your husband and how proud he was of his work. Thank you. Isn't that what it's all about? That's what it's all about. Proud American work, cleaning you. trucks. You said maybe a simple task, but not so simple at all. No. Uh, and he gave of himself, uh, all of himself. Uh, can you tell us how your family will be impacted if you should receive only a 30% award for um, uh, his loss? Well, my son is just, just an 18. After his father passed away, he was not there to see his 18th birthday. Um, college right now to be, to be paid for him. We have other bills that um, our mortgage has to be paid and other things. Now, if he was the breadwinner for the family. Right now, I have to stand in that, in that position where... Whatever he was coming home with, now we do not have it. What the little I'm making, I have to be careful how I spent it now and make ends meet for our family. Yes, and I, I keep thinking of what the special master has to go through to try to slice this up and try yes. to be as equitable as possible. It should not be that way at thank all. You. Um, and, and again, thank you for your family. Thank you. Um, Ms. Nordstrom, uh, I think your testimony is particularly compelling. Can you describe more about what notices you were given, even as young students, or your parents were given, or your teachers were given, about the, the status of the health uh, in your school? Um, once we were already back at the school, we received a number of sort of cryptic warnings. We started to get notes home that said, don't drink out of the water fountain, and we were suddenly not allowed to leave the building for lunch. Uh, which was a privilege that we had enjoyed before that. Um, and for some reason, it was supposed to be okay that we walked to and from the subway in that same air, but apparently eating lunch was not going to be safe. Um, and as soon as we were back, a, 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 a sort of contentious discussion broke out about whether we should be there or not. Um, but, you know, we were not, re we didn't really have any agency in that discussion. That was obviously a discussion that was happening between government officials, parents, um, and teachers at the school. And so we, sort of witnessed a lot of information come out late in the game after the parents' administration started to investigate things. That's, you know, the parents' administration is who discovered that the air quality at the barge was as bad as the air at ground zero in many days. It was the parents' association that discovered that the um, carpeting and upholstery in our cafeteria, I mean, in our auditorium was contaminated. Um, and it was, the, it was the parents' association that pushed the Board of Education to finally replace the filters in our ventilation system. That was something that was supposed to be done before we went back and did not get done. But all of that took months to unfold. So by the end of the year, it was pretty clear that we should have never been there. But we never really received that information at a point where we could have acted on it. Certainly, 
if the, you know, if, if the, the sort of government officials charged with our care had been honest about the situation, I think it would have been appropriate to remove us from the premises, but no decision like that ever got made. Instead, just these small steps where they were going to hose down the debris, and then, you know, they were going to replace the carpeting in the theater, but not the seats, and small steps like that got made, but nothing substantial got made, and so we just kind of at the end of the year looked back and realized, oh, God, we shouldn't have been here. Sounds like malpractice to me, that uh, you would have been allowed to be educated there. Uh, and then Mr. Alvarez, I wish I could talk to all of you, my time is limited, but Mr. Alvarez, I just wanted to offer you uh, my thoughts, prayers, uh, and the strength that you show. It's extraordinary. You represent this audience filled with first responders and volunteers. And I was impressed by you saying you didn't want anything for yourselves. You just wanted to do the work and help others. Yes. I guess, can you just tell me, other than obvious, do, uh, provide full funding, permanent funding. Uh, what else would you like us to know? Well, I've, I've been lucky because uh, I received my DCF payment. And with my New York City Police Department uh, disability check, I'm doing okay. But there's others out there who, who aren't doing okay, who, who don't have a disability, who, who count on that, uh, that money to, to pay their bills, and, and it's tough on them. It, it's really tough on them. I'll just close with saying, may we be guided by your selflessness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Well, Sheila? I, I, I thank the gentleman who just came into the room. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And to Mr. Cohen, uh, thank you to the ranking member. I was here on 9-11, uh, and I'm reminded of the immediate work of Jerry Nadler and Carol Maloney and Peter King. My recollection is that I stood with them in the first introduction along with their senators. But I was also here on the day of the incident, frankly, in the United States Capitol. No one knew what was going on. All we heard was screaming and banging on the door, you needed to get out. What a small experience compared to those of you in this room as we fled as members out of the Capitol, no one had any information. No blackberries existed. Flip phones did not work. And as we escaped, shoes falling off, we could see the billowing smoke from the Pentagon the plane had hit. Rumors abounded. It's going to hit the White House, the State Department and the United States Capitol. Certainly in that instance, first responders that we had, the Capitol Police, were trying to shuttle members and leadership. And then the stories began to come. Even here in Washington, you wondered where your staff were, whether the buildings were getting ready to be hit. If anyone can self-contain those experiences, just a slight memory. There should be nothing more but clean sailing of this legislation out of the House, in my belief, make it a suspension. What does that mean? It goes to the floor and you pass it immediately. Then it goes to the Senate. And there's no procedural tomfoolery. You pass it. They can pass it on unanimous consent. And then it goes to the President of the United States. And all he has to do is sign that bill to give life to people who are in need. 
I don't see why that cannot be our process. As a member of the United States Congress during that time, I desired greatly in the midst to get to ground zero. The time that I went, flights were not active and we took the train. We actually got on the ground. I would never make the point that I was there during rescue. I was there during recovery. And during that time, I watched with my own eyes men go in and out and in and out, finding remains, finding loved ones, finding their fellow comrades. I think you know I was there, they blew a whistle and they would come with the gurney. They would stand in silence and they would take those remains. As they did so, you could still see in pockets the smoke and debris. I only want to say in this instance that I see no reason for us to stop on this dime. We need to move. Let me ask the special master in the short time that I have. In the claims that you've had and the overwhelming that you've seen, can you tell me whether there is any tomfoolery with those who have come to apply? Should we be concerned about the need? Should we question the lieutenant or the FBI director or the mother and wife that is grieving? Should we question any of those? Should we look to Mr. Alvarez and be concerned about anything that he's gone through that is not real are you facing the devastation of having to say no to people who are in need? Special Master. Thank you, Congresswoman. The VCF, under the Zadroga Act, has not documented any instance of fraud in a paid claim. We have very robust standards and procedures in place. Obviously, as a component of the Justice Department, we take fraud very seriously. We work very closely with our Inspector General's office to investigate any suspicion of fraud. And we have numerous internal procedures in place, including independent data verification with federal, state, and local entities um, to provide independent third-party verification of the data that we receive. But we have never documented any instance of fraud in a paid claim. I'm an original co-sponsor of this bill. I want to thank the proponents, as I've said. I think that is important to put on the record. John Stewart, thank you. I've watched you over the decades. And all I suggest, uh, pass the bill, pass it out of the Senate, give the money, and never let these people look one moment to see that they are not great Americans and patriots and they deserve to be honored. Let's do it now. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. Gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for championing this legislation. I, I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here, uh, for everyone in the audience who is here to advocate for this legislation. It's an important bill. Uh, I see some familiar faces in the audience who came to visit me about a month ago to talk about this bill, to educate me as they've been educating all members about uh, the importance of continuing this important fund and, and providing for these uh, heroes who are, are here and home and, and uh, the families of those who uh, serve their country, not just on September 11th, but in the days, weeks, months, years following that, that fateful day. And I want to thank the gentlelady com for her comments because uh, I I recall that day well because uh, I too was in this building as a staffer and uh, um, we weren't rushed to a safe room by the Capitol Police as some of the members were. Uh, we were given guidance to get your staff out. I was the chief of staff. Uh, and we were told, get them out. So uh, we, however we needed to, walk, run, um, uh, 
that we evacuated, not knowing what was going on, but seeing the smoke uh, coming from the Pentagon. There was talk of uh, a bomb at the State Department. There was uh, talk of um, more planes in the sky. And we don't know where Flight 93 was headed, but we know it was headed in this direction. Um, and for the heroes uh, who were, took action that day and, and said, let's roll, mm. uh, we are, are eternally grateful uh, for, for their heroism. And for those who, in the 18 years since, um, the tens and thousands, tens of thousands of men and women, uh, first responders, relief workers, local residents, whose testimony was so moving, and I, I read it last night, but to hear it in person, uh, Ms. Henry, you're, I know that was very hard for you to, to articulate uh, just uh, how important this bill is to you and your family, but it's, it's definitely had an impact. Um, and it has an impact for my district as well. We have 29 from the 6th District of Virginia who are on the list of, of having benefited from this fund. Um, we have to make sure that not only every year on September 11th that we never forget, but every day we owe it to the men and women here. We owe it to the men and women who sacrifice sacrificed on that day and, and in the weeks after uh, to renew this fund. So uh, I appreciate all the hard work. Um, your education had an impact on me, uh, not just because of, of uh, my experiences uh, uh, on 9-11, but also in learning about your stories, learning about the stories of each and every first responder, each and every construction worker, Ms. Henry, your husband. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm glad to be a co-sponsor of the bill. Um, Ms. Henry, you, you spoke of your husband's pride in his work, the job that he was doing. He knew he was a part of something bigger, of something that was a, a moment in our nation's history that will never be forgotten. And um, and I know that he, he brought that home with him uh, at the end of his day. Can you speak to that pride with which he did his job? I know my, when my husband got worked with local St. Dan, they transfer him over there. I don't think, we didn't have anything in our mind that he would, all this debris and all these things was out there, that he would, got, we would get that. He went, to work, he went to work with pride. I remember my son, Justin, being um, almost, almost two almost one year old, and he's, I remember he's sitting in the back of the van every Saturday morning, we'd drop him at work, and then about two, three o'clock, we'd go back and pick him up, because on a Saturday, I don't work, so it was my pleasure to take him down there. And he, had, he, he was happy to work there. And I'm telling you, I have the badge, that badge he had when they gave to, to enter that building, he never threw it away. He, he hold on to that badge, he said that's his memory. For anybody talk about 9-11, he has that to tell them, yes, I did work at 9-11. I wish I had hold that badge to show it to you right now. I, I, and that, the, that's the badge we have, that's the pass, not a badge, a pass. He had to scan that mm -hmm. and walk in. And this is the, 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 the pass that we have that reminded us. And my husband going through all his sickness, we never thought that it was 9-11 until we met Dr. Dimopoulos from North Shore Hospital, that when they refer us to him, and in talking to him, he said, that sound like the, what your husband had. Did he work at 9-11? And then it, came to my, he said, my husband said no, because he didn't remember, but going back into his pile of papers and stuff, here comes the bat, mm -hmm. his past. I'm like, oh my God, he did work there, and then we brought that up, and that's how we spoke to Matt, and Matt have us right here, and I'm thankful that the VCM is still there with us to help us, because my kids, they miss their dad so much. His only daughter. We don't know, she's going to walk down the aisle one day, what am I going to do? Maybe Justin or Kendall, his oldest son, Kendall is not here with us. Who does who have to step in for the father, step in as a father. And, and my family who stepping in as father, this morning we woke up, we, we drive up last night, 
All we could do is talk about him if, if he was there. He's our navigator. We don't need a navigator. Anywhere we go, he knows. Make a left, make a right, and we would be right there. We, we went to Canada, we went to Georgia for the first time, and we were like, we don't know where we are. And he said, don't worry, make a left, make a right. There's a circle in Georgia, we keep going, and he me, we're going to circle, take the first right, take the first step, and that's what it is, sightseeing. On a Saturday morning, he would say, get him, get him, five o'clock, wake up, wake up, let's go out. Where are we going to? Anyway, just, just jump in the car, we would just leave. That's how we discovered Pennsylvania. That's how we, we, we came to, we went to different places, and we miss that. Right now, we, we want to go out, but it is he's so much in our memory. Driving up last night was not an easy task. It was not easy. And I'm so happy that he helped Justin to, Justin just got his driver's license. He was the one who showed him some of the shortcuts, although one day he did it, he told Justin, follow the police car, and asked Justin was, oh, Justin realized, I'm following the police car and I'm going to somewhere. Justin checked himself and then we still all laughing. You don't have a memory anymore. You're making Justin follow the car, going to the wrong direction, and we had a good laugh at it. So coming up last night, Justin is driving and we're just thinking, if daddy was there, he'd tell me, make a left, overtake this car, take this nice thing, and the police is done to catch you. He said, no, daddy would tell me to stop, the police is down there. So it, we really miss him and my, my husband did enjoy working at Ground Zero. He, he, that was his pride, tell everybody, I did work at Ground Zero, I know what it's like. So we really, 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 really miss it, really, really miss it. Thank you very much. You. I, I hope that we can pass this bill. I appreciate everyone for their testimony today. I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't here for each and every one of your testimony. I have another hearing in education and labor, and so we're back and forth. But uh, to each and every one of you who was here, I appreciate your testimony and for all the work you've done. Let's pass this bill. Thank you. Recognize the gentlelady from Texas for unanimous consent request. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. First of all, these are all good people, and I think they're all going to be committed to you. Uh, I wanted to ask unanimous consent to put in the record an article that said officials demand permanent funding for 9-11 victims, compensation to stem escalating crisis, uh, and I think we hear your cry, and we're going to listen. Ask that, unanimous consent. That, to place it that, in the record. Without okay. objection, the document will be placed in the record. Uh, this concludes today's hearing. I want to remind people that tomorrow, let me, I want to remind people that tomorrow in this room, uh, we'll have a much, we'll have a full committee meeting for the purpose of uh, marking up and reporting to the House floor this bill tomorrow. Um, we will move the bill to the floor tomorrow. We will get this done as quickly as possible, but I do think we will get it done. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses. I want to thank all the first responders and others for attending and for all the work that you've done over the years and for your sacrifices. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. Without objection, the hearing is adjourned.